I'd like to welcome all of you. I think it's time now we can get started. Uh, I will make some comments with a mic like this beforehand and after and in between. While I'm playing, I'm also going to make some comments, and there I'll just try to use a classroom voice because there's no way to go back and forth. Anyway, welcome to the first of, I hope, a series of programs called The Golden Age of the Oboe. And um, I'd like to just take a minute and say uh, how the title of the series came about. Um, some of you know that uh, a little over a year ago I was inspired to take up the oboe again, which I hadn't played since 1951. Uh, it was an instrument I played in high school, I had a very good teacher, um, and then four years in college. I, and all through that time, I, I just used school instruments. The reason was an oboe, the cheapest oboe in 1943, was 10 times the price of the cheapest clarinet. $400 against $40. And um, so that was just beyond uh, our means at that time. So I never played the oboe after 1951. Well. About two years ago, our granddaughter, uh, Julia, kind of a late in life granddaughter, uh, was going into high school and she was already playing some other instruments like the saxophone, but she decided to take up the oboe. And that kind of perked my interest. Um, and so a little over a year ago, we finally worked it out where uh, uh, she gave me a read and I got to try it on her instrument and I liked that. And I got thinking, but it's not practical to play on her instrument. She doesn't live here at Pines Village. A little young for that. <laughs> and it suddenly occurred to me, she's renting this an oval. Why can't I rent an oval? So I went over to Quinlan and Fabish, which is just south of the uh, fire station on the uh, Sunvale Park Road, and said, can I rent an oval? They said, sure. So they handed me a form. And you can fill it out as a student, or the parent of a student, or the guardian of a student. Well, I decided I guess I'll be their oldest student. And uh, so I started, and right away I got thinking, she's taking lessons, why can't I take lessons? So it was arranged that I would take oboe lessons with her instructor, who happens to be here. Put up your hand, Larry. <laughs> who uh, turns out right now is the same age as my first global teacher was when I quit in 1951. <laughs> no, in 1947, sorry. Um, at any rate, this experience has been completely different because I played mostly orchestra repertoire. In high school and college. Uh, sometimes in high school when I could, I played in the band. But, but Larry, besides giving me the usual kind of exercises and things that uh, musicians do, kept feeding me duets, concertos, and so on. And uh, so I would uh, work on those in the last year. And I got to noticing there were basically eight composers, and all of them were essentially uh, 18th century. Uh, the first one was Vivaldi. We'll see a little bit about him today. Born in uh, 1780, no, 16, let's get it right, 1678. So he was about 21 years old, just reaching his adulthood at the beginning of the 18th century. Uh, the last one of the eight was Mozart. He was the <laughs> the latest, uh, born just after the middle of the 18th century and died before the end of the 18th century. So all these composers were 18th century, 
And it's just at uh, the time, well, five of them came very early um, on the heels of Ivaldi, right about the time they were reaching their adulthood, the oboe came on the scene. And so the time was right for these composers to write for the oboe. Um, it wasn't until later in the century that you started getting composers writing the modern type of symphony. Uh, piano was, came along really later in the century. And so many of these composers wrote a number of compositions, not only for the oboe and, of course, strings, uh, but flute, recorder, the kind of instruments that were popular in the early 18th century. So it's kind of a golden age for having composers write oboe music. And I'm hoping in this series to give you a little taste of uh, these eight composers. Okay, uh, we'll start with uh, Vivaldi. I'm going to sit down again. Many of you know that at our age, sitting is easier than walking. <laughs> but it's certainly a lot easier than standing. So if you don't mind, I will sit. Uh, Vivaldi, as I said, was born in 1678. He was born in Venice. Uh, he took a job with a essentially a, a girls' orphanage in uh, 1702. So I guess at that point he was uh, about 22 years old, roughly, and. Uh, at the same time, was ordained as a priest the following year. But at any rate, he was uh, at that orphanage for a couple of decades, and part of his job, besides teaching the girls instruments and doing music, was to write a lot of music. And he did that. Um, he didn't always stay in Venice, though. Uh, many of you, if you could name something by Vivaldi, would name the Four Seasons. Well, he did that in Mantua. Uh, somewhere around 17, or 18, 1820, give or take. Um, and he later uh, went to other places, including Venice, where he died. He was a very prolific composer. Uh, I have in my notes here over 500 concertos for one or more instruments. He wrote uh, probably over 90 operas. Uh, 90 sonatas, something like that, a large body of sacred music, and so on and so on. So uh, there's really a lot there. Now, what I, the music that uh, Larry Ellen gave me was a sonata for two oboes at basso continuo. Uh, which, so it's really a trio, it's called a one trio. And uh, Besides two oboes, a bassoon, or a cello would play a bass clef. And if there was any accompaniment for this at that time, it would have been by strings or maybe harp chord or something like that. Okay, uh, the sonata form has several movements, and this one has three movements. It's in G minor key, has two flats, which I uh, playing on the oboe is kind of a nice key. Uh, and the three movements, they go allegro, largo, allegro, which, um, and this is pretty typical, where you have a, a faster movement, a slower movement, faster movement. I like to think when I'm playing something allegro, well, how fast? Instead of thinking of tempo, I think more, you want the music to be happy, you want it to be danceable. So that's the kind of feeling you want to have. I'm going to turn off the mic and let's go. Now, when the I'll put on my classroom voice. When the Lutheran Music School was or a camp this summer gave a short concert here. There was an oboe player included. And I noticed before she played, she always turned her back. <laughs> Wanted to make sure her reed was still working. In fact, she was having problems with her reed. 
So uh, I turn my back. Now, we're, I'm going to play, try to give you a taste of the first movement. It's allegro, as I said, so want to be happy, want to be danceable. And I'd like to show you a little bit the interplay between the two oboes. So it starts out where the first oval plays alone for two measures, plays this thing. Then the second oval comes in and plays exactly the same thing. And while the second oval is playing that, the first oboe is playing a similar kind of thing, but down a third, so we get some harmony. Then we go into a new pattern. Instead of echoing the second oboe echoing the first oboe as to the melody, now it's going to be the rhythm pattern. And so uh, we're going to start playing eighth notes. And the first oboe will play a couple measures of this, eighth notes. The second oboe waits half a measure and then comes in and plays the same notes that the first oboe had started. Some of you may have sung rounds and choir or something like that. Well, it's kind of that idea. So first oboe. Second oval then is doing the same thing, half a measure behind. There were two notes that were different there. One was on purpose. One note differed in the music and the other I screwed up. Okay. <laughs> now we go to a different rhythm pattern. And in this, uh, well, I'll play the pattern uh, through about a one and a half patterns, and then I'll tell you what the second oboe will do. The same pattern, but not the same notes. And while the second oboe is playing the last, or first oboe is playing the, that last little bit, the second oboe had come in. First oboe, while the second oboe is playing the fast notes, um, follows that up with the same kind of thing. Meanwhile, the uh, second oboe, first oboe, then the pattern changes. The Two oboes are going to play together, and interestingly, in this uh, next measure, the, the second oboe is actually on top. I'm sorry. While the first oboe is playing. I'm sorry. Then, that's uh, a taste of the beginning of the piece. In the middle, the two oboes play together for a while, a third apart. So first oboe, while the second oboe, then the uh, second oboe continues while the first oboe rests. Second oboe's on that half note, the first oboe kind of echoes it. And while the first oboe's on that half note, the second oboe starts a new pattern. First oboe. Second oboe. Back and forth. 
fourth pattern, where the first oboe starts while the second oboe rests for half a measure. Now while he's on that note, the second oboe goes. And while the first oboe's on that, or second oboe's on that note, second oboe. First oval. Second oval. And then they play together. Now the first oval is on top. church uh, for the communion part of the service, or in the communion part of the service, so more meditative. First oboe starts the pattern here with four measures, and then the second oboe will come in after and the third and fourth measures uh, echoing the same pattern. like we started it. So I'll play the 
first oboe for four measures. And on the second half of that, the second oboe comes in. So I'm going to go back to playing together for four measures. First oboe now. So it's very much like the very beginning. Concerto uh, is something written for uh, one or more instruments, uh, usually to be played with an accompaniment. And an accompaniment back in those days would have been um, uh, harpsichord, it wouldn't have been piano yet, or strings, most likely. Anyway. Um, Put the mic back on. For, uh, 
George Philip Telemann. Can you hear me well with this? Okay. He was born, it's German, he's born in Magdeburg. He entered Leipzig University. He was born in 1861, so he was three years younger than the ball. And um, he entered Leipzig University to study law in 1701, but that didn't last long because his real interest was music. Uh, and in fact, I'm just amazed at this, by 1702, so that's the next year, he was, became the music director of the uh, principal opera house in Leipzig. I mean, this guy's just a young man. Uh, and he also wrote music, quite a bit of music in this period for churches in, in Leipzig. So already in his early 20s, Telemann had a reputation. Um, now he's a guy who taught himself many instruments, one of which was the oboe. He's one of two of the eight composers I mean, who make deal with him, uh, who actually played the oboe, um, self-taught. And uh, just to give you a preview of next time, uh, Handel was, is going to be our next composer, maybe one you've heard of. He was the other one of the eight who played. In fact, the oboe was Handel's favorite instrument, which I was kind of surprised to learn. But when I think about it, uh, well, I'll tell you about that next time. Anyway, when Telemann was 23, Handel was 19, just starting university in his hometown of Halle, and the two actually met. They were all maybe the same distance as from Valparaiso to Gary apart. Uh, they met several times and they corresponded, so they were uh, much interested. Well, I think Handel was particularly interested in Telemann at that point, because Telemann was slightly older and had the reputation. Anyway, um, after Leipzig, uh, Telemann uh, eventually spent almost a decade in Frankfurt and then the rest of his life in Hamburg basically in Germany. Uh, besides Telemann uh, knowing Handel, he also uh, became a friend of Bach, who will be coming along in our series. These guys were all born at almost the same time, and uh, became the godfather of Bach's uh, second surviving son, Carl Philip Emanuel Bach who, it's interesting, succeeded Telemann at his final post when he died in Hamburg, uh, his godson. So I can assume he was pretty good friends with Bach. At any rate, um, he was a prolific Baroque composer. They think over 3,000 compositions, of which uh, only maybe half have been found. Um, like Vivaldi, Telemann Well, Vivaldi, even before he died, was beginning to be out of favor. And it wasn't until the 20th century he really got revived. Uh, I think Fritz Kreisler, or some of you remember him as a prominent violinist when we were young, uh, was notable in reviving Vivaldi. Well, similarly, um, Telemann, very popular in his own lifetime, but in the 19th century, sort of out of vogue, and then came back in. 20th century. Uh, anyway, among those 3,000 compositions, I noted there were six con oboe concertos and five oboe sonatas that he wrote. So that's why the time was right. You know, it was a sweet spot for the, these composers to write for the oboe. All right, so we have this concerto in F minor. That means four flats. I don't know why Telemann, who played the oboe, did it in four flats. That's one of the hardest keys. Maybe he just wanted to show off. At any rate, this too has uh, three movements. Allegro, and you know what that's about now. The second movement's going to be slow. It says, Largo la non troppo. Literally, long, but not too much. So I would maybe just translate it slow, but not too slow. And then, um, the last movement, instead of being allegro, says vivace. Any of you know what that means? A 
besides Ellen Balko and Larry Allen. Well, lively. So it's very fast, lively. This is the, um, the grand finale, as it were. Okay. Did I keep my reed wet? That's the next question. Okay. Here I won't do quite as much talking because we're not going to have a first and second oboe to go back and forth. the second measure piano. That means loud, soft, repeats the same notes. Then back and forth, loud, soft. That's tough to do on the oval. You can play loud, but it's hard to play soft. So. short cadenza three different ways. First, I'll just play it as it's written, written on the uh, music. The only difference being maybe a little louder at the top. However, a Baroque musician, Baroque musician would 
would never play it like that. They would um, add their own touches. Maybe the first thing they would do is change tempo. was a period where people wanted to embellish things and so they would maybe go a little further. Whatever. <laughs> and maybe each time they play it, it'd be a little different. Okay, now we go to the third final movement. Vivace. Anybody remember what it meant? Lively. Lively. <laughs> okay. December, I've talked with my granddaughter, uh, the fourth Thursday in December is two days after Christmas, so she's on break. Uh -huh. And what I'm hoping is we can do what's called a foster trio, where um, things like the Vivaldi trio, uh, she and I can play this with accompaniment, and our accompanist's name is Foster, no relation, but it's for a foster trio. Uh, one of the things I'll do on Handel next time, I'm hoping we can play it uh, as a duet and uh, some of the Mozart music and so on. Um, so we'll see if that works out. I don't know, but at my age, I don't play in five months ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I don't play it at all. Anyway, any questions? Where do you get enough air? Where do I get enough air? <laughs> Well, when I was growing up, we didn't own a car, so you walk and you walk and you walk. I don't know if that's. We didn't either. Oh, the other thing is, I pump harder than you do on the I new know, step machine. That. Yeah, I know. Okay. <laughs> I can't keep up with that. Other questions? Well, if any of you come back, we'll have time for another question or another occasion. That's great. Oh, Lois. Sometimes when I'm getting my exercise and you're in your room playing that, I sit in the chair and listen to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a chair outside our room. You know these chairs are halfway down the hallway? Yes, right. Well, uh, we're about halfway down the hallway. Yeah. But that's the first I knew anybody sat there to listen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you can hear, 
uh, things through the doors better than through the walls of this building. Right. George. What is your practice regime? I usually practice in the uh, latter part of the afternoon. Um, I usually play some exercises out of the advanced global book, and when I get to the end, I start over. <laughs> That's a good idea. Um, and then I, you know, I've been working on these various pieces, particularly how to maybe select segments to give you a taste. Uh, so that's the thing I've worked on. Uh, last couple of months I joined the uh, community university band at the university, thanks to Jeff Dool, uh, the son of <laughs> two of our people here from Murdy Woods, uh, Jeff Dobler. So uh, while that's in session, I bring home that music because I have I, first of all, I haven't played that kind of music since high school, wow. which was 1943 to 47, but a lot of it has been written since then. Our uh, daughter-in-law is here, and she was watching a video of the concert that that band gave out at the fairgrounds last month. And, you know, songs I wasn't even familiar with, well, of course I played them because they were in the music, you know, she knew them right away because they were from this last, movie or whatever. Last uh, 40 years. Pardon, last 40 last years. Last 40, 50 years, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyway, this whole thing has been an education for me because I'm learning new things. Uh, and then, in particular, playing the oboe solo or in small groups is entirely different than playing it in a band or an orchestra. Uh, so it's a kind of, it's sort of been reinvigorated my life, to be honest with you. I've noticed. Yes. <laughs> And I recommend it, you know, uh, it isn't always, sometimes you can't take up music. Uh, Dick Brower was a flute player, but he tries to blow it now and no noise comes out. And I've known the same thing with other people, so I feel fortunate. I have a lip that's been numb for 10 years, I didn't know if that would be a problem, it turns out it isn't. Because numbness has to do with sensory nerves and the motor nerves still work. I started to get, um, well, I've got carpal tunnel, which is bothering me more in this hand. Why am I wearing a glove? Because I can't free the oval without it. Um, so that's kind of saved my life as far as that aspect. But, I mean, otherwise you need to have surgery, and I don't know if I'm ready at 93 to have surgery. Well, that's why you have it when you're 65. Yeah, well, yeah, I've had a lot of surgeries since 65, so that Okay, any other questions or comments? Thank you very much. Dick Brower. <clears throat> I don't know if I have to repeat you now that you're in voice therapy, but... <laughs> do, do you uh, listen to concerts of, of these, this music? Yeah, you, you can get a lot of this on YouTube, and... Uh, Sometimes you can get different versions. That might be interesting. And, uh, yeah, uh, it's fun to listen to it. I, and some of the fastest movements in these concertos, I can't play at the pace of. Uh, how do you know about these composers and uh, Wikipedia? <laughs> I didn't learn about him when I was young. I mean, I'd, I'd heard of Vivaldi, I'd heard of, of uh, Handel, I, I don't, maybe Telemann, I don't know, Bach, uh, Marcello I'd never heard of till now, uh, Haydn I'd heard of, Cimarosa, no, not till now, and finally Mozart I'd heard of, so I'd heard of some of them, but I... Is, is the... But that's part of the fun of it now, is to learn a little bit more. Yeah. You know, I, it's never too late to learn new things. The sheet music, is it easily available? No. Well, you have to take lessons from Larry Allen. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, most of this uh, is stuff he's just given me in bits and pieces, but 
a few months, not too many months ago, I was listening to either 749 or 750 on our uh, music, ch on our uh, cable. Yep. Those yep. are music channels, classical. And by the way, what makes these things classical is because we're still playing them. You know, these guys were the popular music of their day. And uh, something in their day that hasn't lasted uh, really doesn't deserve the term classical. It's classical because it lasts. But anyway, um, where was I going with this? <laughs> oh, oh, I heard this thing on uh, coming over seven. I think it was channel seven forty nine. Uh, it sounded like an oboe, and I, it was in the next room. And I went in to look, and it was a Bach concerto for violin and oboe. And this was on, I think, a Sunday. My lesson was on a Monday. I mentioned it to Larry L. I said, I really like that piece. Next day, it appears at the front desk. <laughs> he had the music because there was a violin teacher at the university named Betty Gehring. And uh, when she retired, she gave a retirement recital. And she wanted to play the violin in that concerto, and Larry played the oval, right? Uh, so he had the music handy. And that uh, will, we'll, we'll get a taste of that uh, a couple months down the road. As you can see, it takes a while to do these things. Okay, other questions, comments? Do you also play in the Michigan City Bond? No, the last time I played in a band was in high school. <laughs> a few years ago. <laughs> and of course, an oboe wasn't very good in a marching band. In 1945, on my 15th birthday, it happened to be VE Day. And I was in the band, among other things, at that point, so I marched. But I didn't play the oboe, I carried a flag. <laughs> it's not an easy instrument to walk. And play. Okay, any other? Well, if not, I thank you. You've been a thank you. very nice audience. And, uh, well, good. Thank you. And before we all go, can we sing happy birthday to you? Oh, you want me to play it if I still have a read? <laughs> no, you can sing it. Well, go ahead, play. No, 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 no. We got happy birthday to you.